Let's jump straight into the question here. What is the net capacity when lifting from the main boom over the rear? Now, remember the last two sample questions were over the side. So now that we're working over the rear, we know that we're gonna be utilizing a different part of the chart that's on the same page. So we know our first step is gonna be finding the gross capacity. Our configuration is on outriggers. The counterweight configuration is ABC plus A. The main boom amount is 170 feet. This time it does not give us a main boom angle but it does give us a radius of 80 feet. Between those, I can find my gross capacity. So let's slide over to the page here. So remember, our configuration is on outriggers over the rear. So we'll be using this portion of the charts, not this portion of the charts. From there, I've confirmed that my main boom amount is 170 feet. So I know I'll be utilizing this portion of the charts right here. So we can get zoomed in a little bit more here now that we've narrowed it down. My radius is 80 feet. So within that 170 foot of boom area, I'll go to the 80 foot mark, which is here. And then remember, our counterweight configuration is ABC plus A. So, like you already know, we simply slide our finger over from the 80 foot mark and come down from the ABC plus A portion. Remember, it's really important to use a straight edge as well to make sure that you line it up correctly. And you'll see that the gross capacity is 36,000 pounds. All right, so let's come over here. And we can write down our gross capacity amount, 36,000. So finding the gross capacity was very easy for us now. The two other columns, which typically have spreader bar deductions in them, are NA. So moving up to the extension. As you can see, we do have a jib mounted on the crane this time, and it is the 60 foot jib. Whenever the jib is mounted but not being utilized, we must make a deduction for the weight of that extension. The tricky part can be finding where those deductions are, which we went over in the first sample video. So we're going to slide down to where it shows these deductions. And now this is on page 23 of 25 in the load charts. And right underneath number 10 here, it's gonna list all of our deductions. And as you can see, letter D is the 60 foot jib and it notes that it weighs 3,200 pounds. So let's come back up and write that amount down, 3,200. Now remember, you always want to write what it is next to it. You can just put jib. Very simple. So the next row represents the offset for that jib, which is 15 degrees. Now, don't let this confuse you. No matter what the offset is of the jib, you're still going to deduct that same 3,200 amount. So even if it was a, a zero degree offset, it would still be 3,200 pounds. So that takes us to our next deduction, which is the block. Again, it lists it right there. So we can just write that amount down. 2,600 pounds for the block. Here it notes that there are four parts of line. Remember, we won't focus on the parts of line until the end. So let's move on to our next deduction, which is the ball. It lists the ball as 750 pounds. 750 for the ball. Again, it does list 15 foot below the tip for the auxiliary line, but we won't make that deduction yet until we get to our next deduction, which is the rigging. It lists that it's 300 pounds, so I can write that down for the rigging. 
Okay, so now let's focus on our parts of line, and starting with the main rope. It says that we have type N wire rope rated at two pounds per foot. So let's go see what we're good for with that amount of wire rope. So we're gonna pull up our wire rope capacity chart here. With four parts on type N wire rope, we're good for 90,800 pounds. Now with our gross capacity being 36,000 pounds, we actually only need two parts of line in order to make that lift safely and within the manufacturer's recommendations. So that means we're gonna to have to make a deduction for two parts of line from tip to ground based off of the crane's configuration. So just like in the last sample question, we'll go up to our range diagram and see exactly what the tip to ground amount is. Okay, so slide down here, coming on to our range diagram. So when I come up from my 80 foot radius mark to the arc of the 170 foot of boom mark, and then I come over to the right side along the right here where it lists the actual height, you can see that it's right around 159 feet. That mark goes just below the 160 foot mark. So we're gonna call it 159 feet. So we're gonna come back over here up here and off to the side just like on the last one right 159 now since there's two parts of line that are excessive for this question and their weight is two pounds per foot we must multiply that by four after using my calculator I know that the amount for that deduction is 600 and 36 pounds and that is for the excessive main rope okay so we're still not quite done as you can see where it lists the ball it shows that we have one part of line and there is 15 foot hanging below the tip now remember anything that is excessive or not being utilized below the hook we must deduct so if there's 15 feet and it's at two pounds per foot you simply multiply 15 times 2 which is 30. So I'll write 30 down for my auxiliary rope. So I know I've went through every single line. There are no more deductions, so I simply have to subtract all of these from my gross capacity amount. After subtracting all of those deductions from my gross capacity, I've determined that my net capacity for this specific configuration is 28,400 and 84 pounds went through each and every single one of these so as you can see letter D is 28,484 pounds something else I want to stress to you is if you come up with say 28,482 and in the multiple choice it says 28,484 you're only a couple pounds off don't be alarmed. Like I said before in the in the previous sample question, the range diagram is difficult to read exactly what the distance is from tip to ground because it only shows it in five foot increments and it doesn't show exactly what's in between. So it's normal to be about a foot off, sometimes even two feet off, just in the multiple choice, make sure to select the answer that's closest to yours. This did happen to be on my exam on two of the questions, and I just went to the next closest number and I got all of them right, so that was something that was alarming to me during my exam, but I understood what I did right away. So that concludes sample question number three. Let's move on now to sample question number four.